This is Duke University. Global trade and environmental justice. Human rights China issues today. are still... The term Ubuntu. A the Alien and Sedition Accident. He's making inferential discoveries. The importance of an archive. The John Hope Franklin Center. It has long been assumed that if the revolution was going to be televised, it would be featured in a hip-hop video circulated on YouTube. But Lester Spence raises questions about our understandings about hip-hop and politics in his new book, Stare in the Darkness. Professor Lester Spence of John Hopkins University joins us on Left the Black today. And we're also joined by Professor Lawrence Jackson, author of the new book, The Indignant Generation, that looks at black authors and critics from the mid-1930s into the 1960s that are the bridge group politically, artistically, aesthetically between the Harlem Renaissance and the black arts movement. You're watching Left to Black, and I'm Mark Anthony Neal. Welcome back to Left the Black. I'm your host, Mark Anthony Neal, and we're joined this afternoon by Professor Lester K. Spence, Assistant Professor of Political Science at John Hopkins University, comes to us from his office in Baltimore, Maryland. How are you doing today, Professor Spence? Cold chiller, man. How you been? I've been pretty good. Uh, uh, Professor Spence is the author of the new book, Stare in the Darkness, The Limits of Hip-Hop and Black Politics, University of Minnesota Press. Congratulations on the new book, Lester. Uh Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much. Thanks for the blurb, too. Oh, not a problem. You know, if the book has this, uh, has a big question, um, and, and you pretty much stated in the introduction of the book, you know, what are the politics embedded in hip-hop production, circulation, and consumption? There's been a lot of chatter, you know, virtually since hip-hop has been around, about what role it can play in political movement. When you talk about groups like uh, Public Enemy and, and Boogie Down Productions and, and even NWA, you know, there are conversations about political content. You know, more recently over the last decade has been all this chatter about conscious rappers. You know, you know folks like Talib Kweli and, and uh, you know, Common and, and all these kinds of folks. And you really cut to the heart of it in the book. You know, on the one hand, talking about this kind of almost superficial production of politics around the consumption of hip hop, and its relationship to real politics on the ground. Now, talk a little bit about your inspiration for the book. Uh, well, there are a few different inspirations. The book project really started at first about, it was kind of a book about youth, black youth attitudes, right? Mm -hmm. But it ended up morphing into something much more. Um, and once it became this other thing, my, my what I wanted to do was just kind of I want to deal with like uh, this project on three levels. So one level, it was just about like, okay, people are making all these claims about rap and how hip hop works, but none of them have tested them empirically, at least right. not in the book length, right. Right? right? right. So to one extent, it was just a matter of a straight social science work, you know, whether effects using straight social science tools, whether it's, you know, large end surveys, whether it's content analysis or even um, experiments, right? Um, on another level, though, I was interested in examining this neoliberal turn in black politics, mm. right? To, to, to talk about neo, the neoliberalization of black politics using black popular culture. And then the third thing I want to do is kind of play with the boundaries of what we consider to be political science. Uh, political science is one of the more conservative social sciences. Absolutely. And what I wanted to do was kind of t uh, show um, to my colleagues in political science, to people who are like me, for people who are coming up under me, that there are a range of phenomena that we can think of as political and should treat seriously within political science. You're watching Left of Back. We're here with Professor Lester K. Spence uh, from Johns Hopkins University, political science department, author of the new book, Stay in the Darkness and Limits, Limits of Hip Hop and Black Politics. You mentioned the need for empirical data. Um, and, you know, I, I got a kick later in the book when you go back to a, a survey, a black political survey that was done a decade ago. Uh, or actually more so, almost 20 years ago, yeah. and, and notice that, you know, folks who had negative ideas about hip-hop and its impact and its lyrics, and, and you broke it into this kind of hip-hop generation and, 
it's broken down into a hip-hop generation, pre-hip-hop generation, and, and what struck me was that, you know, sev over 75% of the people, you know, who weren't hip-hop generation, uh, who said that they disliked hip-hop, didn't listen to it, right? Yeah. Another, more than 65% of those folks who were hip-hop generation were folks who didn't listen to it. And so there's always a lot of chatter coming from folks about how negative hip-hop is, and they'll cite the one lyric. And you know, you read the Huffington Post and all these kind of places, and the folks will go on and write these little thousand word essays based on something they saw Little Wayne say, right, on an award show. But you went back and looked at the lyrics, right? Over 470 lyrics, over 300 artists, you know, things that, you know, were singles released from 1989 to 2004, 5% of them, you know, are top 40 in the R&B. What was it like to actually have to engage this vast period, 15 years of actual hip hop lyrics, and, and how did it challenge your thinking about what you were expecting to hear in terms of the impact that these lyrics have on black politics? Um, that's a great question. Uh, what I was kind of surprised was, I was surprised about the degree to which hip hop lyrics reproduced uh, this, uh, what I call kind of a neoliberal mm -hmm. governmentality, bar, mm -hmm. um, barring a sampling from Foucault. I was surprised the degree to which it did that. Um, but uh, so, you know, when you're talking about the language of the, of the hustler and how mm -hmm. the, the hustler really embodies kind of this neoliberal entrepreneur that we expect it to be, that was the thing that really, really, uh, I think it surprised me more than anything else. It surprised me to the point that to a certain degree, I ended up making that neoliberal line a lot stronger when the book was written. And in fact, it was that that shaped the second project I'm working on. So that was the thing I really I really focused on, right? That, and that was really, particularly given that we don't really talk about neoliberalism, right. um, not within social, not within black politics, not within the academy, and definitely not in the real world. Right. And, and what um, you call these black parallel publics, right? Yes, right. yes, yes. That, that was the thing that really struck me, right? So it's not really like hip hop and rap are the death of black politics, you know, which is what people who really don't listen to the okay, genre right, right, like right. to claim. But at the same time, it, it really is uh, emphasizing, or my work really emphasized, or my findings really emphasize the degree to which hip hop and rap crystallize what we're already living with. Yeah, absolutely. You're watching Left to Back. We're here with Professor Lester Spence, political science professor at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore, Maryland, the author of the new book, Stay in the Darkness, The Limits of Hip Hop and Black Politics. Uh, in the third chapter, you spend a lot of time looking at, you know, on the ground hip hop activism, looking at particularly two organizations, um, the Hip Hop Summit Action Network. Um, and we think about Russell Simmons and Al Sharpton and Louis Farrakhan and all those kinds of folks dating back to 2001, um, but also the National Hip Hop Political Convention, you know, which had its foundations in 2003, you know, a, a group of on the ground activists, folks like Bakari Kidwana, you know, Ross Baraka, um, you know, Angela Woodson, I mean, a range of folks who were involved in the founding of this kind of moment. And, and you see, you, you know, you suggested there's something really different going on. You know, one organization is founded by activists Another organization that is founded by industry leaders, you know, basically attempting to self-police themselves, mm -hmm. you know, more than anything. Can you talk about, you know, what kind of influence, particularly the latter, the National Hip Hop Political Convention, you know, had thinking about black politics going forward and particularly in terms of its influence on the rise of Barack Obama as a political figure, um, you know, in 2008, 2007, 2008? So... <laughs> so the so the the first so I'm going to talk a little bit about the title, right? So right. the title "Staring in the Darkness" is like a line for what I think is one of the most powerful uh, rap records ever recorded, right? Uh, Follow Leader by Eric B and Rakim. That second part, the limits of hip hop and um, and black politics. What that section really deals with more than any other section are the limits, yeah, right? So right. to the degree to which we can talk about black politics, what we have to wrestle with are these significant constraints that regular on um, that um, that people who are like on the social movement side of black politics um, have to wrestle with and people who are like politically elected uh, officials like Kwame Kilpatrick, yeah, okay. who I also right. have to do. Right. right? <laughs> so 
in the chapter where I'm dealing with the hip hop social action network and then the uh, and then the uh, the radicals, right? Um, you've got two uh, with the hip hop social action network. What you're talking about are two different types of constraints, right? So one of the is the constraint of neoliberalism, where they're embodying this kind of business approach to political activism, right? right. So their right. solution to some of the economic crises that uh, that many black working class folks are dealing with, hell, many of us are dealing with, was to like give people like a financial empowerment workshop. Right. right to to help them manage their affairs better. Right? Or, or if you're Russell, um, right, you can get a credit card, right, to work on your credit by putting three hundred dollars right, right, into like the account. Right, like the rush card. Yeah, right, yeah. Right. I mean, like that's it, right? And then when it comes to like quote unquote real activism, right. You know what their their limit is is this old school civil rights model, right. where you have these brokers work between the quote unquote man and then right. everybody else. Right. 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 And the only real victory they have is with the Rockefeller drug laws, right? And, and nothing else really translates beyond that. Yeah, that's absolutely right. So that's, that's the one set of hurdles they deal with, right? But in the other set, when you have the, the straight-up radicals who share you know, our politics, their, uh, their constraints, they've got first serious resource constraints right. in that they're like, right. what? They're like kids like me at the time. You know, they're in their 20s and 30s. They don't have a lot of loot. They don't have a lot of um, a lot of um, a lot of physical resources to create networks. The internet, as we know, it don't it doesn't, it doesn't exist, exist, right? So they they've got significant resource constraints, but then at the same time they've got these constraints by you know by organization um, by older black radical organizations, right? That that give them a set of frameworks that uh, from which they can operate, but. Given that the time, given that the political context is so different, those previous contexts don't aren't fully able to encapsulate the stuff that we have to deal with on a regular basis. I mean, you, you show, for example, the National Hip Hop Political Convention. Their kind of point by point plan is largely based on the Black pa Black Panther Party ten point plan, right? But yep. you know, again, the politics of 1968, 1967 are very different than the politics of 2003, 2004. Yeah, yeah. So, so I don't talk about this fully in the book. But if we were to take the, uh, if we were to take DJing, for example, right? You take something like I was listening to Otis today mm -hmm. by Kanye and Jay Z, and they take Otis's. Uh, what's the sample they take from? Uh, try, they take, um, try a little tenderness. Yeah. Yeah. Try a little tenderness, and they make it something very different, right? right? And that's what hip hop and DJing does. If that's what DJing does at its best. They take pre-existing sounds and they use it in very different um very different fashions right a remix the, culture right yeah i mean the the challenge of our politics wow. is yeah. that we're not quite able we're sampling that's wholesale that's interesting yeah right without a, w without necessarily adapting and adopting it to mi to fit yeah. the current context that's interesting right? so that so that aesthetic viewpoint that does so incredible things artistically we've yet to fully translate that into a political context i mean that's a great that's a great point let's say yeah yeah <laughs> and 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 that that's what our challenge is right so so wow. i remember so I was talking to this nonprofit group in Baltimore, um, the really, really, really dope group, right? Teaching them to political, uh, to politically organize, right? And one of the kids asked me whether I thought hip hop was revolutionary, right? And in some ways, it as an art form, the use of the turntable yes. as yes. a musical instrument. Yes. You know, I'm a science fiction kid. There yeah. is no science fiction author who could have come up with that idea. <laughs> I mean, absolutely brilliant. And it's coming from black working class kids. Yeah, I mean, right. you got to get the hell yeah. out of here. You got to be yeah. kidding me, yeah. right? Um, with that said, though, you know, it politically it is not revolutionary. People are, right. and people aren't e even yeah. revolutionary. It's like people engage in activities that we can later think of as revolutionary. Right. Right. And, I mean, it's interesting because it, it reminds me uh, of of Most Def, his song "Fear Not of Man." And he talks about, you know, how folks talk about hip hop like it's some giant up in the hills. <laughs> right. Yeah, he goes, you know, hip hop yeah. is the people, right? It's not yes. some giant. In, yeah. Yeah, that's it. That's <laughs> it. Um, but the child. Yeah, but the thing is, is that the movement as an art form. So here's another way to think about it. The lights, the, the rays from the sun. Right. We're, whenever we look at the sun, 
we don't really see the sun as it is. We right. see the sun as it was eight minutes ago, because that's how long it takes for the light from the sun to reach here, like 93 yeah. million miles away. It's like these art forms, right, are like at point, are, are like here, and they're not quite caught up with the real world, but our politics are even it's behind that. that. Yeah. Right? That's so true. that's it, that's that's it. And that's what I'm trying to wrestle with in this book. Um, as both as, a, as an empirical enterprise, because it's important for us to understand as a social scientist, but also because this is where we live and this is what we're trying to change and we have to deal with that. That's the challenge. You're watching Left to Black. We're joined by Professor Lester K. Spence, political science professor at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore, author of the new book, Stare in the Darkness, The Limits of Hip Hop and Black Politics. One of the things I loved about the book, each one of your chapters makes a reference to Rock Hill. Uh, what was so significant about making sure that Rakim had a voice in this book? So there are a, a lot of things. When you write a book, you know there's a lot you leave on the table, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, so one of the things I wish I could have pushed more, Jelani deals, Jelani Cobb deals with this in his book, but one right, of the things, on. yep. yeah, I wish I could have pushed a little bit more, are the, are the, the, the artistic revolutionary aspects of hip-hop. Right. And then some of the brilliance embedded in some of the tracks. Right. Yeah. So what takes follow the leader? What makes follow the leader different than the stuff that came before it is you is its use of imagery. And it, even if, if it's use of like straight up techniques from literature, like alliteration, yeah. music makes mellow, maintains to make melodies yeah. for MCs, yeah. motivates yeah. the breaks. I'm everlasting. You know what I mean? I can go on for days and days. Yeah. The rhyme displays in this great <laughs> like next phrase. Right. I mean. <laughs> So what I wanted to do was like throw a little shout outs, you know, to what I think is what top five, you know, yeah. follow leader. I, I'd say it's number one, but I mean, I give top five. Yeah, right. So no. what I wanted to do was take little passages that I thought uh, dealt with some of the core themes in the text. Um, yeah, that's my guy. I mean, to the extent I can represent, I, I, I seek to use the book to represent something that doesn't have Detroit in it. You know, because that's my that's my city. I got a Detroit Ningster. Um, I wanted to give a shout out to Rakim, right? Yeah. Brilliant. Uh, you know, one of the things you know that, that that's interesting about this, and you know, I think you captured it in so many different ways that there's this difficulty in doing this kind of work. I mean, you mentioned how conservative, you know, the field of political science is, um, and, and I've talked to Richard Eiten about this, you know, in terms of his book, The Black Fantastic, and the difficulty of doing the work of a political scientist, but also when you have that ear and sensibility of an arts critic, and, and trying to find a space that does both justice. And, and dealing with the pushback from publishing companies that either want the artistic criticism piece or the political piece, but really don't want the two of them, you know, to be engaged in any significant kind of way. Yeah, I mean, so to use a, so to, to jump across genres, right? So yeah. you, one of the keys of a, of a jazz musician, a jazz musician, you know, a jazz musician has made his mark if he's found his voice, right? right? So right. You know, you right. can you know Miles Davis is playing something, you, you know, just because his right. trumpet has a unique voice. Right. For us as social scientists and academics, we're trying to do the same thing, right? right? And in general, right. it's hard to really find your voice, but particularly for us, those of us with black sensibilities and black working class urban sensibilities yep. in places that aren't really used to that and in an academy that isn't really geared to that is really, really hard to do it, right? So for me, I've got two different challenges. One is that when I'm doing straight up social science, it's like I'm trying to marry my social science stuff with my hip hop or my house music sensibilities, and that's, that's hard enough. And then given that, you know, I also do kind of public intellectual work, whether it's right. NPR or other things, it's kind of hard to take, you know, to, to cut back on that voice yeah. in my writing just as it's hard in the doing the NPR stuff to cut back on my academic voice yeah. when I'm doing that, yeah. right? So it's really, really a challenge. But I mean, that's that's what we signed up for, Absolutely. right? We Absolutely. signed up to to make these spaces more amenable to us, right? More amenable to people like us, and we signed up to in order to investigate what we think of as the most important phenomenon in the discipline we're trying to study, Absolutely. right? And we're trying to make a mark in. You're watching Left of Black and we're joined by Professor Lester K. Spence.
political, uh, political science professor at Johns Hopkins University, author of the new book, Stare in the Darkness, The Limits of Hip Hop and Black Politics. Um, I, I want to ask you what your next project is going to be, but I'm hoping at some point down the line, you're going to be talking about this Detroit techno book that you absolutely have to do. You know, <laughs> so yeah, 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 yeah. Um, <laughs> It's funny because I, I I got on this I got on my shelf a couple of books you know they've come out with a couple of really good photography books about the Detroit ruins yeah, yeah. and I'm realizing that there are a number of us a number of us in the academy with Detroit roots there's me there's Earl Henderson mm -hmm. there's somebody like uh, Heather I think it's Heather Thomas at Temple uh, Thomas Agru. Um, at the University of Pennsylvania, but right. there are really only a couple of us of Dyson, this generation. Right. Michael Eric Dyson, right? <laughs> yeah, Michael Eric Dyson. There's really only a couple of us of this generation who can really tell that story, right? Of how, um, you know, of how something like techno develops. Yeah. You know, we right. would if you told people that techno developed in Detroit, most people who didn't know the history <laughs> would kind of laugh at you, right? Right. right. So it's my goal to do something like that if my man Carlton Goats doesn't get to doesn't get first doesn't get to it first. But the project I'm working on now is kind of a pro, a long project uh, or a project dealing with the neoliberal turn in black politics in general, right? Whether you're talking about the growth of the prosperity gospel in mm -hmm. black churches, whether you're talking about um, the way that the politics of contemporary HIV/AIDS, or you're talking about the way black mayors deal with the challenges of, um, of, the, uh, of the urban crisis, right? That's, so, uh, so my first book was kind of an attempt to deal with that within the confines of black popular culture. Now I'm dealing with the entire scope of it. So that's gonna be the project I'm working on now. After that, I think I'm gonna work on, I've gotten seriously into photography. Hmm. I think I'm gonna work on a visual politics project and um, you know, right now, you know, whatever else, there are a couple of other things I've got on the back burner, but that's what I'll, those are the things that are really, really taking my, uh, taking my, um, or, or, or that are really, um, what's the word I'm looking for, that really um, are capturing my attention right now. You've been watching Left to Black. I'm Mark Anthony Neal, host, and we've been joined by Professor Lester K. Spence, professor of political science at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore, Maryland author of the new book, Stare in the Darkness, The Limits of Hip Hop and Black Politics at the University of Minnesota Press. Thanks for joining us, Lester. Hey, real quick, you know, I don't see people giving shout outs. Go ahead. I want to give a shout out <laughs> to my five kids, Imani, Kamari, Kasarian, Niar, and Kari. I want to give a shout out to my wife, Sean. I want to give a shout out to my people in Detroit, my people in Inkster, <laughs> to my people at Michigan, and to the Q's. Oh, thanks a lot, Lester. <laughs> Take care. We Real Cool by Wendelin Brooks. We Real Cool. We left school. We lurk late. We strike straight. We sing sin. We bend gin. We jazz gin. We die so. Welcome back to Left of Black. I'm Mark Anthony Neal, your host, and we're joined this afternoon by Professor Lawrence P. Jackson, Professor of English and African American Studies at Emory University. How are you doing today, Larry? <laughs> Doing pretty good. Thank you so much for having me on the show, Mark. Well, thanks for joining us. And, and we really want to talk about your latest book, The Indignant Generation, a narrative history of African-American writers and critics, 1934 to 1960. Um, your first book, which came out in, in 2002 uh, on Wiley Press, uh, is kind of an intellectual biography uh, of Ralph Ellison. So you clearly have an interest in this generation of black writers who are essentially you know, operating in what some might think of of the lost years, you know, in between the Harlem Renaissance and the black arts movement. Um, what drew you to this particular period of, of, of black writers? Well, precisely what you just mentioned, this idea that there's sort of like an interregnum between the Harlem Renaissance and the black arts movement. And it just so happens that, you know, from my point of view anyway, I mean, this would be the richest part of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. um, arguably, there's a, uh, you know, sort of a beautiful flowering that takes place, um, you know, within the last 25 years of the, of the 20th century as well that has yet to be named as a sort of a literary period or, you know, we don't have a handle on it yet. Right. But um, I was very concerned or, you know, just thought it was curious, this sort of omission where you had this really rich a um, uh, 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 serious renaissance um, for about 25 years, and it included all of the people, you know, that were they were icons or iconic figures for us. And of course, I think that's part of the reason why we sort of 
you know, lack a, uh, a, a way of pulling together this group of people. I mean, they're so outstanding as individuals, and we've done some serious work on them as individuals. But very rarely did we link them together. And, you, you know, you mentioned the Ralph Ellison biography. I mean, that was one of the things that I wanted to do with Ellison. You know, you would just hear over and over again that Ellison really, he had no peers. And, you know, um, you know there's a famous argument, a debate with Irving Howe about his relationship with Richard Wright. And sort of from that moment in 1964, I mean, Ellison spends a lot of time really disencumbering himself from other African-American writers. But, you know, when you look at the, at the rich early foundation of somebody like Ralph Ellison, you know, you find him in conversation with everybody and serious conversations with Richard Wright, with William Attaway, with... Um, with Albert Murray, um, you know, and I wanted to try to pull uh, this group together and and to show that um, if you don't have Richard Wright going to um, to Harper's, you don't have Gwendolyn Brooks getting the book contract for A Street in Bronzeville. And Gwendolyn Brooks is hunting down Ralph Ellison to get her poem in Negro Quarterly. And the same way that we talk about the uh, the modernist period, and we would think about you know um, the uh, uh, seven seven arts or you know the different little magazines or something that would be coming out. I mean, we have the same the same sort of process. I mean, mechanically going on with African American writers and with somebody like Dorothy West, who's going to start um, you know a journal that we 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 just haven't looked at it um, closely enough, I think. And she's going to bring together in Challenge um, magazine, you know, she's going to bring together this group in the very early 1930s. And then, of course, I, you know, I think it reaches really its peak with the issue where you have Marion Minus and uh, Richard Wright. I mean, they've come from Chicago. They are really, really ardent leftists at this point. And, you know, it's sort of this new, um, this new way of thinking about the, what it means to be black. And, of course, the, uh, you know, sort of the problem of um, race in America and race and the arts and race and class and race and gender in some, some, some really interesting ways. But that's, of course, 1937. The, uh, the bookends that I use, you know, sort of 1934, we often think of that as the, the formal closing of the Harlem Renaissance because of the, the death of uh, Wallace Thurman right. and um, uh, uh, Rudolf Fischer. And, um, you know, we sort of have this, this, this moment where people have gone overseas and now they have uh, uh, had some, 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 some time to spend in the Soviet Union. And, you know, uh, things are getting really, really complex internationally. And uh, black American writers are sort of taking a stand on a, on a number of issues and, and thinking of themselves internationally in a new way. But um, it's a really remarkable uh, uh, couple of months because you have uh, uh, Richard Wright getting published for the first time. You have Chester Himes in the Ohio State Penitentiary getting published and reaching a national audience. And in 1935, of course, you know you have the Harlem riot. So with this, <clears throat> with this, um, uh, uh, sort of like the Harlem riot of 1935 is a is a is a is a groundbreaker because. In 1919, you know, you have what is more like a racial pogrom, you know, where, where bands of um, marauding whites in Chicago right, and other parts of the United one. States. Right. Yes, exactly. Right. The Red Summer where, you know, you have the African-American neighborhoods and communities really being destroyed by, um, you know, sort of groups of white vigilantes. But in 1935, you know, we have really the uh, the urban unrest that has become, you know, sort of characteristic for much of the rest of the 20th century, I mean, right. the 1940s and then the 1960s, of course, and people have been talking about, I think you yourself have been talking about the way that uh, we're, we're thinking about um, different patterns for urban unrest that we will see, and, you know, our, our friends overseas are experiencing in England now. One of the things I think that's really interesting, and you're watching Left of Black, I'm Mark M.P. Neal. We're joined this afternoon by Professor Lawrence P. Jackson, professor of English and African American Studies at Emory University and the author of the new book, The Indignant Generation, A Narrative History of African American Writers and Critics, 1934 to 1960. When you mention this period in the late 1930s, I mean, another interesting dynamic about that is that there's a significant amount of um, African American writers, I think about someone like Roy Otley, for instance, who are on the payroll of the WPA. Right. Um, and, and so it's an interesting, really interesting kind of moment. We can talk about what the WPA's interest was in hiring African American writers specifically, but writers in general. But here, there's a tremendous moment of economic crisis. You know, the, the federal government thought it was interest, thought it was important to keep American writers and American artists still invested in their art. Um, very different dynamic than what we might witness, say, in 2011 now, <laughs> exactly. you know, in that regard. Um, 
the other thing that's interesting about this period, and of course, some of these names we know very well, Richard White, Ralph Ellison, um, maybe there's folks we'll know very well, someone like a Margaret Alexander. Um, you mentioned Dorothy West, who's, you know, her book The Wedding, you know, is, you know, probably her most well-known publication. Um, so on the one hand, you have these tremendous giants, but what also marks this period of time are a significant amount of African-American writers who are very productive, but they never get the kind of profile of, say, a Ralph Ellison or Richard Wright. And many of them, I think, as an important narrative to this story, are teaching at historically black colleges and universities. Um, you begin the book talking about someone like Jay Saunders Redding. Sure. Um, within this sure. context. And, and again, these folks who are working not only as just, you know, trying to be literary figures themselves, but also working as literary critics. Talk a little bit about Redding's career and his career arc. I mean, you mentioned, you know, in looking at this period, the relative invisibility of someone like Redding in comparison, you know, to Richard Wright. Well, this is the maybe the embarrassment of riches, but when we when we think about you know these central figures, and we we say James Baldwin, Ralph Ellison, Lorraine Hansberry, Richard Wright, Gwendolyn Brooks. I mean, now they were all prize winners, uh, people at the peak of the craft. Um, mercifully, today we also talk about Ann Petrie, and you mm -hmm. mentioned uh, Dorothy yep. West, and we sort of have we sort of have you know sort of a, a pantheon. I mean, these are basically the, uh, the the canonical writers from the middle of the 20th century. Um, I was. I was maybe maybe shocked is a bit of an overstatement, but I was quite surprised to find out that this guy, Saunders Redding, um, you know, African-American from Delaware, uh, Brown University uh, 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 degree, um, was Phi Beta Kappa at Brown, in fact, and, um, you know, spent most of his career teaching at Hampton and, you know, taught also at Elizabeth City State College, not so far from you, I guess. And uh, this was a guy, he, he, I think Redding published 11 books, um, serious books. And uh, Redding's uh, No Day of Triumph, in my view, would be the most important, um, arguably the most important work of um, prose nonfiction published in the 1940s. I mean, certainly rivaling Richard Wright's Black Boy as, you know, the, the most significant uh, treatment in prose of African American life, mm -hmm. it's it's completely unknown. Mm -hmm. uh, this this is a book that was reprinted in in the 1968 Arno Press collaboration with the New York Times when they you know sort of reprinted all of the black classics or very many of them. I guess they they were library uh, reprintings. No Day of Triumph um, it has the uh, misfortune, I guess, of missing the the paperback revolution that takes place after the Second World War, mm -hmm. and um, you know also then is published in, um, uh, get the date wrong, 40, 42, I think, um, is published, you know, sort of during the war years, and, you know, it wasn't about the war, it was about the racial crisis at home. And then Redding's politics, he's seen, you know, perhaps as being a bit moderate for the tastes of the uh, generation of the 1960s. But at the same time, I mean, this is somebody who is absolutely essential um, to understanding this period. And part of his obscurity, um, like I said, taught at an HBCU pretty much his whole career. He ended his career um, teaching at Cornell. But Redding also reviewed basically everything that was, that was written by an African-American or about African-American topics in the black press. So we're talking about um, somebody who's like really the glue for uh, the opinions and attitudes that are generated about um, African-American writing. And I was, um, you know, I was doing most of this work before the digitization, uh, the effective digi digitization of uh, so many of these newspapers. So I was reading these microfilm. But it was just, it was amazing to see Redding weighing in on, um, in, in the manner of uh, somebody like yourself or Michael Eric Dyson today. I mean, really weighing in on all of the national topics of import and and always with um, you know with an interest in race and an interest in blackness, and I thought it was I thought it was quite remarkable. You know, one of the things that's so interesting, and you mentioned you know what's happening with the digitization of the black press, having access to the Chicago Defender and the Amsterdam News and, and all these you know incredible you know black newspapers, and and what you get an element of that I really think has been missing or was missing before you know a lot of this digital revolution the last five years ago is that, you know, all of these scholars and critics and literary figures from this period naturally saw themselves working in the context of being public intellectuals. They were writing for a general audience that was reading the black press. Um, there really wasn't that kind of division between, 
their readership in the black press versus an exclusive academic and scholarly readership the way we sort of see that split in, in you know in contemporary moments sure they they definitely saw their role as you know people that had to wear many hats i mean you know you had to be an effective journalist um mm -hmm. reading also published fiction mm -hmm. i mean you know again this is a guy who is who is making a uh, really really important examination of um I mean, what, what Redding understood as the, uh, the perpetuation of subjugation by way of African-American colleges. He, he writes a novel about this, the way that the, the problem is not so much the uh, white supremacy or the, the cauldron of white supremacy, but, but rather the, the, uh, the, what the, me the mechanics of uh, perpetuating subjugation at, at, at black colleges. I mean, the way that, uh, you know, there was a caste system in place. And the way that uh, people were trained away from um, from active critical thinking, um, he he journeys to India, um, you know, sort of at the behest of the State Department, and writes about you know sort of an American in India, and you know, of course, this is Redding's great uh, integration moment, you know, where he doesn't have to be a black American, right? We can just he says I'm an American, uh, but still, you know, this is a this is an interesting work that. Um, has uh, has quite a bit to do with the the way that um, Indian politics are functioning at the time, I and mean, Redding was constantly being presented with audiences of um, young people who were saying, you know, you guys aren't far left enough, and you know, we we typically think of these um, many of these intellectuals. I mean. Uh, Academics, Hugh Gloucester, who became president of Morehouse College, um, was another person who was, who was sort of important. The um, Nick Aaron Ford, who was the chairperson of the English department at Morgan State University, um, Ford is probably the the most black nationalist minded, I guess, of the group. <clears throat> Though they were all uh, quite serious about um, um, dismantling racial segregation. But what's interesting is that you know we sort of think of them in almost utter isolation and right. these people had profound relationships and were thinking of debates and dialogues with some really prominent black leftists so you got Paul Robeson is a key figure obviously we need right. to spend more time dealing with right. Robeson right. but then you know I mean Redding's colleague uh, you know I mean in, in a broad ecumenical sense is uh, Doxy Wilkerson right Wilkerson is a He's teaching it at Howard for um, late 30s and half of the 40s. Then he moves to um, Adam Clayton Powell's newspaper in Harlem, right? He starts uh, editing that newspaper. I mean, that's a short-lived gem. And there's a story behind the dismantling of that uh, newspaper, The People's Voice. Right. Um, you know, we always talk about the paper, I mean, more or less as sort of the, the vehicle where um, Adam Clayton Powell was able to, you know, sort of generate enough public support so that he could make a successful run for Congress. Right. But the uh, the paper itself, I mean, it's, it's <coughs> completely remarkable. Um, you've got uh, Freddie Washington, right, the, the yeah, Hollywood Belle, right. who is uh, she's CP. I mean, she's, she's Communist Party. You've got... Um, um, uh, I'm sorry, the name of the other journalist. Now I'm, I'm, I'm just not. Uh, <laughs> this escapes 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 me. Um, it, it'll come to me. Um, but as a prominent African American uh, female journalist, um, then this this newspaper is going to be scuttled in this sort of uh, Cold War politics um, thing with um, you know sort of the, the prominent black politician Max Jurgen. Who had been in South Africa, and then Jurgen uh, had been working with the um, YMCA, and then Jurgen went into the CP, and then he um, he he had a, a uh, some embarrassments, and then became basically uh, you know sort of turned by the FBI, became sort of an FBI informant mm -hmm. in the second half of the 1940s, and then you know you've got Jurgen sort of bringing down People's Voice, and then Jurgen also brings down the Council for African Affairs with W. B. Du Bois and Robeson, and you know he sort of becomes like a really active cold warrior domestically and then internationally later, but you know when uh, Wilkerson, Doxy Wilkerson, is at the uh, the People's Voice, you know he's generating. Uh, um, cultural criticism at the same time. Uh, Harold Cruz, mm -hmm. uh, GI, um, a high school educated guy, um, comes back to New York after the war is over. He's reading Wilkerson and is thinking about um, getting serious with the Communist Party because of all of these bright 
um, black intellectuals that they have, you know, sort of hovering around the, um, the Abraham Lincoln School and the, uh, the different Jefferson schools and these, you know, sort of evening adult education programs that they have going. Lorraine Hansberry is a teacher in these uh, uh, arrangements when she comes from the um, University of Wisconsin and she comes from Chicago to New York in um, be about 1950, 51. But it's, it's just a remarkably fascinating, you know, milieu that is available to people. But, you know, we, we, we have, I think we've lost some of the richness when we don't deal with a figure like Redding hmm. and uh, Wilkerson and uh, Cruz and James Baldwin and Richard Wright and Ralph Ellison. I mean, you know, this is, this, these are the, the people who they're involved in these debates with. Um, you know, there's a reason why um, so much of um, the richness of Ralph Ellison's writing, um, there's a, you know, there's a reason why, you know, when you keep turning over the stone, I mean, you find these, you know, sort of um, fascinating uh, motifs about uh, Africa, for example, in Invisible Man, or when you have these, you know, sort of um, completely ambiguous um, uh, uh, moments with a figure like uh, Ross the Exhorter and the, and the, uh, the black nationalist. And um, there's a reason, you know, where you don't have, you know, sort of an utter or complete repudiation of uh, communism or, um, you know, sort of Marxist arguments. I mean, because th there was a there was a community that was involved in the, um, the the creation of this of these ideas and sustaining them, and so people are, are, are I think they're constantly, you know, sort of in a long conversation over, um, you know, so so many of the the active points that they um, that they had to take. The classic case of this for me is um, when Paul Robeson brings out a new paper. <clears throat> excuse me, um, freedom in uh, freedom starts its run about uh, about uh, fifty about fifty one fifty two, and Lorraine Hansberry is the book editor. She does most of the book reviews and the cultural criticism, and she gets her friend John Oliver Killens, who was not not widely published at that time. Uh, his book, Young Blood comes out in 1954. She gets him to review Invisible Man, and Killens writes this um, damning review. You know, it's, he never allowed it to be um, reprinted, but it's, you know, it's this remarkable, you know, it's a screed almost, right? You know, it's, 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 it's really uh, hard-hitting, you know. And it, it, interestingly enough, I mean, none of the black critics um, gave much praise to Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man. In fact, it's, uh, you know, it's a sort of fascinating moment where um, um, Ellison is being supported by the, uh, the elite academy and by the, uh, you know, right. sort of the elite, elite publishing at, right at that moment, and then it, you know, he picks up some uh, some support later on. Uh, people didn't think it was um, it was <laughs> an unambiguous statement. <laughs> yeah. They wanted somebody that was going to, you know, sort of turn over uh, racial segregation. <clears throat> excuse me, have a heroic uh, black protagonist. Yeah. Um, but what's fascinating is that for the Killens, Hansberry, Ropes, and Wilkerson uh, Cruz group. The argument that they are having with Invisible Man, um, I think, really has a lot to do with Ellison's portrait of Todd Clifton. And, yeah, you know, just to rehash a little bit of the plot, you know, the hero is really not so much the Invisible Man. It's this guy from Harlem who's the Harlem organizer, and he's, you know, um, you know an Adonis kind of figure, um, very mythic. And instead of leading the Harlemites, you know, in a rent strike or, you know, sort of uh, 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 um, jobs in education, um, it, Clifton winds up selling these Sambo dolls and then is killed by the police. And then, um, you know, this is what sort of gets the riot going. And, of course, you know, Ellison is um, drawing off of, the Harlem riot of 1943 and the riot of 1935, both of them break out like the riot of 1964 because of a case of uh, uh, police brutality. Right. Black men are shot or supposed to have been beaten. And um, But what had happened was that NYU, in uh, the spring of 1952, a GI named Enos Christiani was trying to lead a protest against the use of black stereotypes. Um, there's a fair, a student fair, and one of the, um, one of the fraternities and sororities <coughs> or student groups, they're, they, they've got like a, a big picture of a black mammy, and it's sort of like, I don't know, throw a bean bag at the mammy, <clears throat> win a prize. And Christiani, um, you know, like I say, he's a graduate student in economics. He's going, uh, you know, along, and he sees this, and he loses it. And he says, you know, you've got to take this down. This is unjust. You know, it's 1952. It's not 1935 anymore, right? You know, you can't do this to us. 
I mean, you, you know, we're always talking about the way the films, um, you know, they have this remarkable shift in 1949, right, right. Um, where, you know, all of a sudden, um, you know, the representations of African Americans completely shift. It's like no more step and fetch it right. <clears throat> after this period. The differences between the two versions of um, Imitation of Imitation Life. Imitation of Life. Right, you know, a great <laughs> index of that, yeah. Exactly. And, uh, but, but, but what happens? Christiani is shot by, shot and killed by NYU um, uh, campus police. And I think that when Killens and Hansberry see the representation of black protest in Invisible Man, I mean, they just say, look, man, you know, we don't have time for this right now. And in fact, because they're, you know, they're a little bit younger than Ellison. And Ellison, of course, was, you know, always a kind of person who was hanging out with the older crowd. Right. And I think that for, um, for uh, Killens and Hansberry, you know, they say, look, we've got to have a, uh, a, a revolution in representation, a re revolution in literary form. And, uh, of course, those two figures especially, I mean, they are right at the center of the foundation of the black arts movement. Um, you know, <clears throat> interestingly enough, I mean, Leroy Jones, he is moving into the orbit, you know, by the mid 50s and then certainly by the uh, by about 1960 because the other figure really that um, that's so important here is Julian Mayfield mm -hmm. and who also is you know working with the Freedom Group Mayfield is organizing the uh, the Writers Collective the Harlem Writers Guild excuse me and um, this is going to be also the group that will go to Cuba and you know you have Mayfield and uh, right. Jones right. and right. Richard right. Gibson right. Right. And, uh, you know, they're going to they're going to be um, thinking about international affairs and black revolution, you know, sort of by 1960 in very formal um, kinds of terms. You know, the the uh, the uh, the stories of um, of uh, Mayfield and Jones, you know, collecting arms to get to uh, uh, Robert Williams. Right. And, you know, I mean, basically a lot of people had to leave the country around that. And of course, where do they go? No longer are we going to uh, the cafes in Paris. Now we're going to well, go Cuba. to Nkrumah's right. Ghana right. and, and Cuba. Cuba. Right. Yeah. You're watching Left to Black. I'm Mark Anthony Neal. We're joined this afternoon by Professor Lawrence P. Jackson, author of The Indignant Generation, A Narrative History of African American Writers and Critics, 1934 to 1960. Let's go forward a little bit, Larry. Um, the Indignant Generation is a, is a big book. And, and we've talked a little bit about this, right? It, it, it really is on some level, you know, literary criticism, but it, it's also a social history of the period. And, and, you know, we talked a little bit about the difficulty of trying to place a text like this um, with a mainstream tri trade press versus, you know, an academic press. And, and, you know, you are in with a bunch of other of our colleagues who've had these same kind of struggles over the last decade. This irony at a time when, in some ways, more black books are being published than ever before, right? You know, when you walk into a Barnes and Noble or someplace like that, you know, in the prominent display of African-American literature. But this kind of detailed criticism of African-American life and culture and literature um, seems to be disappearing within that context. I mean, even as you talk about the period going back to the 30s and the 40s, and you mentioned these journals and these little magazines, you know, there literally was always some place for a black writer to be published. Um, and, and these were places that even if they didn't have tremendous budgets, you, you could live a life as a writer, right? I mean, you could feed yourself, maybe not a family, right? But you could <laughs> feed yourself, you know, as a writer. And now we're in an environment now where, you know, the major trade presses want to stay away from big books like yours. Um, in some ways, you know, David Le Levering Lewis's books about W. E. Du Bois couldn't be published in the current academic and uh, current publishing environment, right? It would be you know, impossible and, uh, to uh, publish a two-volume right. biography. As uh, great as they were so. when they were published, you know, a decade or more ago. Yeah. At the same time, you know, there are very little spaces in contemporary American culture for black writers to really just write about the culture. Everything is news-driven driven by a, a, a news cycle, you know, so you can't write about anything unless it's an anniversary of someone's death or someone's birth or, or this, this and that. And I wonder what that does to this generation of critics not to have these opportunities, right? Now, we could talk about something like the Huffington Post as one option, right? But now increasingly, you know, folks are writing but not getting paid for that writing, you know, mm. within that context. 
Yeah, I mean, you know, here here we are. Is the um, is the internet and um, you know the digital universe? Is it uh, something that you know sort of furthers democracy or the democratization of access, or is it something that winds up closing it down? As you said, <clears throat> you know, you can you can sort of do as much writing as you want. Whether or not you'd be paid for it or be able to sort of make a living um, doing it is another question. Uh, these major works, I mean, very influential to me. I mean, writers that I would model myself after David Levin Lewis and Otto Rampers had mm. published two volume works mm. on major figures. Um, I'm not certain that before Langston, um, before Rampers had's two volume Langston Hughes biography, people considered Langston Hughes seriously. I mean, right. I think that they thought right. of him as the author of uh, children's books and, you know, I mean, a poem that he wrote when he was, you know, 17 or 18 years old. Right. And, <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> You know, but once you have these, once you have these, these, these extraordinary labors, you know, sort of by, by these, uh, these important scholars, um, and, and good writers, you know, I mean, right. people who are right. reaching for an audience, um, then I think we got to see both of the figures, you know, much differently. Um, I was reading Du Bois, as, obviously, as you were, um, when I was in college and I was in graduate school. And I think that in a lot of those spaces, we were some of the only people reading Du Bois. Now, everybody reads Du Bois, right? Yeah. I mean, he is understood as a national American figure. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a major shift, very important. And because so much of the work that we do is, um, or at least the reason I, I, I became an academic, I mean, I wanted to, um, I wanted to liberate Africa, but I also wanted <laughs> to... Uh, to 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 counter um, the uh, the ideological structure that I thought was dehumanizing to me and to uh, the people that I knew, and part of the way that we do that is with the works that we produce. Now, when the market gets involved, I mean it it is today making it almost impossible to yeah. you know do this kind of scholarship or this kind of writing because everything is supposed to be uh, 200 uh, pages. Right. Or, I mean, uh, deep thought is really the thing that I, exactly. I mean, the, the, the level of detail in the indignant generation, right, allows us to piece all these narratives together. I mean, that that's what really is the connective glue, the detail that normally we wouldn't have, you know, if someone was just trying to cover one of these figures in 220 pages, right. you would never have that kind of connective tissue as you describe it, you know, to give a, the broadest view possible, right, the most sophisticated view possible of the era. No, I mean this is the thing. You know, if you sometimes you look at these um, very sophisticated, nuanced portraits of a figure like James Baldwin, you you never see him in conversation with other African American writers or African American intellectuals, and you know you think, well, you know maybe that's the way it was, and you know maybe this is just sort of an isolated figure, and you start going through the record, and you 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 say, my God, I mean, you know, this is somebody who was like. At the uh, at the restaurant with Richard Wright and C.L.R. James at the same time. Now look to me, right. you got right. it. That's got to be thirty pages right there. Right, I all right. Because you got you know to quote Jay Z and Kanye, right? You got a bunch of Negroes in Paris, right? They're going to know where they are, right? They're going to be in conversation with you. They're going to break bread a few times, right? Exactly. It, it's not going to be in this exactly. isolation. <laughs> No, one of the um, one of the most eminent professors that we have here at Emory as an emeritus professor, Richard Long. Mm -hmm. um, Richard Long used to meet James Baldwin on Saint Germain du Play yeah. in 1957. Man, and you know, to me, I, I felt bad because I wasn't able to get that in the book. And you know, <laughs> I, I I turned in the manuscript, Mark, and the editor says, "Well." Yeah, uh, Professor Jackson, you signed a contract for a two hundred thousand word book, and this is two hundred forty thousand words. Uh, right. We can't right. publish this, right. you know. Right. And, you know, right. I mean, I moved heaven and earth to uh, to try to get the word count down, but to keep the the fullness of the story. I mean, we are really suffering. I mean, our our story is being is being pared down. It's being distilled. It's being cut away, and yeah. and and we're losing so much, you know, when that happens. Absolutely. Uh, we're watching Left to Black. You're watching Left to Black. I'm Mark Anthony Neal. We're joined by Professor Lawrence P. Jackson, author of The Indignant Generation, A Narrative History of African American Writers and Critics, 1934 to 1960. What's next for you, Larry? I'm working on a uh, biography of Chester Himes right now. Another figure from that period, right? Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I mean, now this one, uh, Himes, you know, w had such a uh, juicy uh, kind of life. Yeah. Uh, you know, he's really, he's really a remarkable uh, figure. Um, you know, this is the person that gives us the template for, um, in his own life, you know, so he gives us the template for the Malcolm X and Nathan McCall, you know, these important mm -hmm. autobiographical uh, writers. 
um, throughout the 20th century, but, you know, sort of the African-American that um, goes to prison and, uh, you know, writes or thinks their way out in a, in, a, in a sense. I mean, you know, the reconstruction of identity that goes on over and over again. And um, Himes, you know, is completely underrated and is not known for, you know, sort of the major works that he political works uh, of fiction in the 1940s and you know I mean it's such an investment in unions and social class and he has the very very important treatments of of black male female relations um, I think probably uh, he's the might be the, the the most significant writer from this period to deal with the importance of black romance mm -hmm. and the 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 the, the peril um, of black romance and you know Himes is is uh, is quite quite a character with um, with his portraits, I have a book that comes out in uh, in the spring called uh, My Father's Name: uh, Black Virginia Family After the Civil War, and I did some work, um, sort of some genealogical work, but I was really thinking about my own children mm -hmm. and remembering my dad, and um, I you know went back to his uh, his town. He's from Danville, Virginia, and I just uh, did some work to find out about my ancestors there in Virginia. Uh, Mark, you'll be happy to know that. Uh, According to Ancestry.com or, or, you know, one of the uh, DNA databases, um, apparently my, my lineage, I, I, I go back to the Dogon and Mali. <laughs> 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 you know, so we're going to give a, a big, big shout out to Manchi Diawar and, uh, you know, uh, Bamako and Bambara and everything. Um, but what was fascinating, you know, when I was doing this work, I uh, spent a lot of time in the uh, Pennsylvania County Courthouse reading through the records. And, uh, you know, sort of a going through census uh, records in Library of Virginia, I found out that um, my father's grandfather was born in slavery in 1855. And this is a guy, you know, I mean, he was a tobacco farmer his whole life, um, probably never, you know, went more than five miles from the place he was born or so. And what I found out was that uh, I was trying to figure out how did we come to be named Jackson? <laughs> you know, you're, <laughs> you're really looking for some specificity there. But... What, what happened, it seems as if this man, Edward Jackson, that he, he named himself um, in 1870 when African Americans were enumerated for wow. the first time you know, wow. on the census, he seems to have chosen that name um, in part because he was dealing with um, the, the fact that he came from a broken family and that his mother and father had been sold on 18, in 1860. And um, you know, the, really the, the climax of this, this book is that I, there was a day at, uh, in the spring of uh, 2009 when I was at the library at University of Virginia in the Special Collections. I'm the only person there on Saturday afternoon, and I'm just going through these boxes. <clears throat> I get to this one box. It's just called uh, Ledgers from Pennsylvania, and it's like the last, the last uh, little tablet or book at the uh, back of the box. You know, it's this guy's. Um, it's it's his it's his inventory. And, um, you know, I, I'm sitting there and turning the pages and it's, you know, for $1,690, Sandy was sold to the slave trader. It's, you know, it's one of these moments you can, you, can read, you can read a lot about slavery and you can know theoretically that your ancestors were enslaved. But it was just, it was, it was, it was an incredible moment, um, you know, sitting there looking at this document and, you know, you're trying to sort of keep it together. We're definitely going to have to have you back when the book comes out in the spring, Larry. I would love to. I would love to. You've been watching Left to Black. I'm Mark Anthony Neal, the host, and we were joined this afternoon by Professor Lawrence P. Jackson, author of The Indignant Generation, A Narrative History of African-American Critics and Writers, 1934 to 1960, Princeton University Press, and also the author of a biography, intellectual biography, of Ralph Ellison that was published in 2002 by Wiley. Thanks again for joining us, Larry. Thank you so much for having me, Mark. Take care. by Duke University, online at duke.edu.